Biddy bop boo boo. Brian, are you getting stalker calls? I am. Is that too hard for you to believe? Ah, who's the guy in the middle? How do you get on the show? That's my stalker. <laughs> my stalker. There we go. So, when you took over the Medellin cartel, let me ask you. Did you find it hard initially to get everybody to line up, or was your just your out rampant brutality enough of a calling card that these guys better get in line, or else face waking up with their testicles in their mouth? He you know, to- we've joked a lot about uh, my my uh, ambiguous ethnicity. For some reason, the mustache just puts it into overdrive. Like what Street Fighter Two Turbo was to Street Fighter Two, this mustache is to my ambiguous ethnicity. It is just that much faster and that much more intense. No, no, we'll say born an American male has had that mustache since Mark Spitz sweeped the 1984 Olympics. It's a me, yep. Justin. It's pretty much young. 76. One of the Olympics. See, look at that. Five minutes. This is what I'm saying. The beautiful part about it, because it's happened multiple times, is I get the, hey, Hispanic joke, and right. I get the, it's me, Mario yeah. joke. There's... There's, there's no, no. Those are the only two jokes there's, you can there's make. There's no Mark cohesion. Spitz. That's true. And now we can add the Mark Spitz to there. Mark Spitz too. Mark does spit. Why does he always got to be spitting? I'd like to say that this was for uh, Movember or whatever. It's it's really not. It was because I had a beard and I saw the opportunity for a very silly mustache, and then I immediately kind of got tired of the silly mustache. But I'm like, well, there's no way I'm I'm shaving it in and not at least wearing it on nsfw and weird things yeah like yeah. I, I gotta get at least those two shows worth of it and then i'll shave it no you look great i think brian and i fantastic. are working on november too that's right we've been we haven't shaved in three years <laughs> we're excited <laughs> about this weekend you guys that, you guys take november in a completely different sense and your charity drives are wait. into each other <laughs> amazing all right gentlemen let me get we're a little tweet this out yeah, let's let's tweet it. All right, here, check, check. Let me hear you, Justin. Hi, I'm Justin. Here's my check-in. Here, a little bit more. Hi, check, check, check. One, two, three. Probably going to talk like this in this kind of volume. All right, blah, that's blah, good. Blah. All right, Andrew? All right, I'm screwing things up here. Hold on. <laughs> Sorry. I just, I have, I'm using my two computer setup, and I somehow managed to just get rid of a window. It's what I do. That's how you do. All right, All right this is my audio. There you go. Looks pretty good. I can talk like this in this kind of volume. All right. All right. Always tricks me every time I want to respond. You're like, why are you talking with no lips? And now drinking a glass of water. <laughs> right. weirdthings.com, right? Is it embedded? Or should it I give the Justin feed? Up. Yeah, what's up? Let me make sure I ain't gonna have no alarms beeping at me. Ooh. Got lucky. Now I'm gonna do Picture some quality seems pretty good today. Push-up. Yeah, man. Bandwidth has been nice. Everything looks good. You're you're coming to me in uh, HD widescreen, which is pretty rad. Wow. It does blow your mind. Sideways. Do you guys notice my, my awesome SpaceX hat? My, yeah, my it's a pretty awesome sweet hat. Sent to me. Yeah. Of course, uh, then there's the actual dragon hat, which you gotta get at the launch. Oh, you snake. Wah, wah, wah. Will you uh, tweet this? All right, let me retweet, Mr. Bry. Yeah, yeah. What? What? All right, I'm ready. Retweeting. Shut my Twitter down. <laughs> Come on, Brian. Go ahead. Put on your SpaceX hat. We're all wearing our SpaceX hats. Go ahead. Put yours on. This is an actual space laser. I got it from an alien. He was asking sure about it hats. wasn't just a probe, Brian? So I just killed him. 
Oh, it can be used as you got to work up to this, but man, you can shove it up there and pull the trigger till it goes click. Mm-hmm. All right, we ready to go? Affirmative, Andrew. We're ready. Okay, yes, excellent. sir. We're totally ready. Hold on. Let's. All right. I'm recording and go. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Weird Things Podcast. I'm Andrew Main, joined by Mr. Brian Brushwood. See, I only took a half sip because I knew as soon as I as soon as my soda came to my lips, I'm like, he's gonna call on me first. So I took a half sip, and then I made a whole point of pointing that out. And then it was time to introduce our other co-host. Wasn't it all awkward? <laughs> yes. And joining us as usual, Mr. Justin Robert Young. Hi, everybody, it's me. Don't panic. If it takes a while for him to respond, it's because he's doing the show from the 70s because of his time-traveling mustache. Tell you what, man, it, I wish it more... Is, it, it's a reality distortion field of a, of a mustache. I feel like I could get away with things I wouldn't otherwise do. I see that mustache, and I feel like I woke up from a reverse coma. It's like the broken window theory. Like when people have mustaches, they're just drawn to do bad things because they assume, like, well, what can it hurt? I got a mustache. That's I mean, listen, co- I, I just coma. really feel like I'm I'm a tucked in white shirt and uh, polyester slacks away from Argo cosplay. Oh, totally, totally, totally. I think uh, I think you're you're kind of there now. Took so. Let's get on with the weird stuff we're going to talk about. Yeah. Entirely too I, normal here. Let's weird it up. I'm going to take yeah. off my shirt. So on Halloween, uh, that's not when this happened. Um, that was the wrong article. <laughs> but it, you could have read it on Halloween. <laughs> on St. Patrick's Day, this yes. did not occur. <laughs> so io9 has an article somewhere that they put on their website, io 9 and it was 17 mm. things to do when you achieve immortality. Right on. Now, when so it I says thought, immortality, it's talking about, like, got a wish from a genie immortality or body uh, body backups, virtual backups of your identity more immortality. We're going to go with the science kind of immortality, what to do when you get that. And uh, they're based upon the idea of where the singularitarians and the people who are all into, like, hey, let's all live forever – well, what do you do when you can live forever? Chess. Uh, I don't know. Swimming pools. Backstrokes. Right. Maybe a little. Maybe a little croquet. Maybe a little crochet croquet. It's a new mashup. Yep. Well, let me move right on to the next one. We <laughs> seem to have this one settled. No, uh, I would imagine. Now, here's one of the weird things. There was a there was a pretty good article. On- hey, that's the name of this podcast. On- <laughs> hey, ding ding ding. <laughs> <laughs> There was a pretty good article on uh, on Cracked.com talking about uh, why it would suck to live forever. And one of the points it brought up that really stuck with me is, have you guys noticed as we enter adulthood that like time seems to speed up? Like when you're a kid, a year is an eternity. A friendship for a week is like you've known them forever. And then, uh, but then, are you like, trying to tell us you're sick of us? No, no, no. I'm just saying, like, like the the horrific. Brian, picture, are we breaking up as friends? I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Maybe it needs a little space. <laughs> uh, one of the things that because we hor- can spend more time with you, Brian. I mean, if that's what this is about, like, we can totally clear our schedules. We can spend more time together. Just, just looking for guys with bigger mustaches. I'm we sorry. We could do this in one room, Brian. We could be there. <laughs> we can come there for you. I know you're going through a lot right now. <laughs> the horrific image that it painted. You got a new baby, and you want uncles in the house. Just say. It. Just say it. <laughs> Say that's actually true. That'd be awesome. Can you imagine we have the kid and you guys move in and then we just turn on the cameras and it becomes Hollywood gold? <laughs> My weird dads. Uh, oh, but th- the idea was <laughs> the 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 idea in the article that it Why presented I needed therapy was Go like ahead. as you start to measure time in eons, you know, in geological epochs. How long then, is an eon, Brian? Uh, I think an eon is uh, like three wiles, maybe two or f- which is like 12 moments, right? I think an eon is from when the final episode of Game of Thrones to when the new season starts. <laughs> that sounds about right. Same for no, Breaking no, Bad. No, 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 no. He was the one that wasn't Fankman. Um, in- <laughs> no, you're thinking of uh, Winnie the Pooh's friend. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> That's why it takes so long to answer. Uh, but but as you start to measure time in thousands of years, like you meet people and it's like they're just like flashes in your life. They come and they go instantaneously. You can't keep track of them anymore and Flash you stop even trying. Answers, if you will. Like, like, isn't that isn't that kind of what happens with old people as it is? Like, they meet people like, what's the point? You'll be dead in a few years. We'll all be dead. <laughs> Maybe. I, I, I think. <laughs> Wait, hold Shit. on. Wait a minute. I, I guess. Can you can you give me the the the, the TLD on what you were just talking about? Because I don't quite I didn't quite get the point. As you live longer and longer and you measure time in longer, and yeah. longer increments. Uh, y- time seems to speed up to where like years just blaze past you and friendships come and go in the blink of an eye. And it's just like, what's the point? And you already see that with old people in their eighties. Like they meet someone like, like a six year relationship to us is like, wow, man, you were practically married. That's like a lifetime that you spent with that person. But someone in their eighties, like they'll meet someone and then what's this going to last? Maybe six more years. And then one of us will die. What's the point? I guess all right. So so you your 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 theory is that that this phenomenon and I do agree because obviously like I remember from from the end of summer when summer ended in school the concept of the next summer it was like the game of thrones. Yeah. Like summer and winters. Like it was just like like this will last for the ne- the next 14 years and what happens we will all all be different people on the end of it. Empires will be built and fall. Uh, it's just going to be forever. And and then as you get older, uh, you know, all of a sudden you're like, holy crap, is, is this year over? Yes. Like, I, just, I feel like I blinked and I farted and 2012 is just gone. And right. now no, no one is going to be like talking about the world ending anymore because I, everyone just kind of forgot that about three months ago. They, you know, they've, they're, there's some interesting research into that about how, you know, when time flows or when it doesn't flow. I know personally that if I have a really good trip, a really good trip, it can seem very vivid. Like I had a, I had a great time. It was this time last year that I was in Shanghai, and I was out there for under two weeks. But it was a very great experience, and it felt up a lot of time. You know, when I'm just sitting around. If I'm in the middle of writing a book, I'm in the middle of the book. But if I'm not doing anything else, I live alone. Um, I'm a, I'm a hermit. Mm-hmm. So uh, days bleed into weeks, weeks bleed into months, they bleed into years. That, that That's a thing that sort of made me want to step up and do things like write and do more things, which because of that, I just... Leave a mark, sure. I mean, I remember I was living in this house for a year, and I'm like, holy crap, a year went by, and I didn't even think about that. And I mean, I guess that's, me. that's what... Uh, I mean, I'd like to have more life, but how do you suppose you solve that problem? Like, do you think in a culture where everyone gets to live forever, do you think it's just assumed like the longer you live, the slower you do things or the bigger projects you undertake? Cause I mean, if you're going to live forever, all of a sudden at some point, you know, once you've done a few 10 year projects, then you start to take on your first hundred year project. And then that gets done. You do that two or three more times. And then you become the kind of person like, well, I'm going to go for a thousand year project and you work for a thousand years on something. But yeah, I think that. But I think that as you do that, is it sort of your frame of reference changes. Now, if you knew you had, if you could look look like this, be this conditioner or healthier forever, and you start to think about, okay, make sure your girls get you know raised so they're you know mature adults and you look out for them. But then you could say, okay, uh, you know, would you want to go live in some other country and learn the language to the point that you could be a local, like Sean Connery, and you only live twice. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> but think about that. I mean, that's a thing where you could say, okay, not just learn a language, but immerse yourself in a culture so you could have a whole experience in that way. And that, I mean, that's do, just the okay, interest, so really. Here, here's well, the question. Well, I mean, like, shouldn't we also, like, already have the answer to this question? We, we've seen life expect, expectancy go to, you know, uh, unheard of levels from, you know, just uh, hundreds uh, of years ago, uh, shouldn't we already have the blueprint for this as life expectancy would go farther and farther from here to the point where, let's say, hopefully we eventually get to a point where we choose when we want to die, if ever? I mean, I like, guess uh, have, like, I guess like, do do are we more prone to do longer projects now that we live far longer than we used to back in the day? Or is it just, you know, do we live the same kind of cycles of like we focus on things for 
you know, a, a percentage of, you know, like, uh, you know, for a year or so, if, well, if we do, or we've already seen a culture where, uh, retirement is much less nowadays about, I mean, when our parents, uh, when, when our grandparents retired, the idea was, you know, you traded your time for 40 years for a company. And then when you were done, you just, you know, went fishing every day. And, uh, nowadays, even that's kind of different because we, we know that, when you do retirement that way, you kind of tend to kick the bucket within, you know, two to five years. But but then, uh, oh, wait, what's that, Andrew? Well, I, I, I mean, I, uh, I would say that unfortunately for the economy, well, sorry, no, Andrew's dad. That's yes. the problem now is is that well, you know, well, exactly. So nowadays, like like retirement is code. It usually means you know starting a job you love. Maybe you don't make as much money, hopefully. but you do something different. You begin from you start from the beginning and. I mean, I would imagine you would get a more extreme version of that, where you do something for fifty to a hundred years and then switch. Well, that's the thing is that you know we have a problem with a lot of a lot of cities and states are facing fiscal crises because they have people who they start at twenty five, they give them these they, they work there for thirty years, and they retire with very generous pension packages that are equal to their their entire year of you know what they made in a year, and then now you look at you're fifty five and you're going on retirement, and life expectancy could be another. 30, 30 years, years on top sure, of that. Yeah. And somebody's got to write those checks. And that's that's the other side of it. We won't worry about that. But as you mentioned, like it, old age, how does it change in adult education? That's not a thing that you, you, you who would think you let's send a 50 year old off to school to learn something new. Mm -hmm. Now it makes great sense. So I think that's part of it. And think and, about and, the things we have to make. And, and part of what maybe makes life precious now is that we have to make choices. But Instead of choices, you can have priorities, and you can say, "I will do this first, then I will do this, then I'll do that." And there's a lot of things that I don't do because, you know, there's no such thing as immortality right now. You sure. know, I'm a guy. I don't drink. I don't do drugs. I don't smoke because I just don't want to do anything that will take any time off of what I have, right? Or, or time that I could be creative. But do, now, do you think that part of the reason, uh, you know, we've seen as as life time of uh, life expectancy has extended uh do you think that culturally we've seen a difference as far as what we expect of people in their 50s and 60s like uh i would imagine you know when i was kid a kid it was you know embarrassing if so and so retired and then you saw him working at walmart or something like the idea of doing a job after you retire was always associated with like oh that poor person needs to work whereas nowadays i think we see it more as like oh so now you want to do this for a while I, I think it's healthy. In, in my family, you know, my grandfather and both my father, when they hit retirement, that just meant moving on to a different job because both of them were very healthy, very good prime of their life and have a lot of things to do. My father still works and, and you know, he's active both. You know, he was a federal agent for 30 years and you know, carried a gun and then now he, he's involved in fly fishing, does a lot of uh, civic stuff too, waterway conservation and, is a, and keeps himself very active in those things. And, and I look at that as my model. I'll have different phases of my career, things I will do, but, you know, I'm still, you know, I'm still living off the plans that I made when I was 14. Yeah. Are you ever going to retire, Justin? I, I, I don't, I, I don't see retirement. At, I mean, like, like you said, like, I, I don't see that, that, the the idea of getting the gold watch and going off, you know, to just live a life of leisure is something gold that watch. really <laughs> gold <Yeah>. watch. <laughs> he hid this watch. Um, <laughs> I guess like I've I've always like fun for me is doing things and creating things, and when you do things and create things, and you want to make that you know a part of your living, then you know why would that ever change? You know, so, I'll, I'll, so when you think about like really really long lifespans, you think about okay. You're going to see Elon Musk and other people colonize Mars. And you say, okay, well, what's Which, the trip to Mars? By the way, that, well, that, the, the lid got blew off that, the, the uh, initials there, right? Officially Wait, what? or what? I said, apparently somebody put a, there was a comment on weird things just uh, right before we, we went live that apparently at some conference, uh, one of the SpaceX engineers said that uh, MCT, right? It's... And it's for Mars Colonial Transport. So that was we had an article about this mystery space, this mystery rocket that that SpaceX is working on. Elon Musk has talked about, and it's MCT were the initials and the speculation I put out that there could be Mar Martian Mars crew transport or Mars cargo transport. But Justin says I didn't know that. So Mars Colonial Transport. That was yeah, I guess, and, and I'll look into it. I just I just approved the comment right before we went live, but. Uh, huh? 
but yeah, no, apparently, apparently the, the, the genie's uh, out of the bottle, if that's to be believed. And that's extraordinarily exciting that, you know, we're, so like, this is not this. down we're the right line. Now. Like, people are building this. That's amazing. Well, well, Justin and I are wearing our SpaceX hats. Okay. Uh, Hold we'll on, Andrew. What, what, before we start talking, let me put on my SpaceX hat here. So yes, we can put on our, our SpaceX discussion. hats. So we live in a period of time where we're credibly talking about Mars colonies and the idea of longevity and living that. Like, you know, if you go ask me, right, do I want to go to Mars? I don't know, like trip there six months. And then it's not like I'm just going to pop my feet on the ground and go, all right, did it. Let's go back. You know, I got to go. Don't want to watch some of this time shifted TV. I need to watch it real time. It's got to be so, uh it's got to be like a what okay so let's say let's say lifespan is not really a concern you're just planning the trip how long do you give for Mars to make that uh what is it uh uh 12 months out there 18 months out and then 18 months back is that what it is Yeah you need like think you like 6 months I don't think trying to think of uh We'll just make up an error. We'll say it's eight months out and eight months back, yeah. give or take, right? Uh how long do you spend on Mars to make that worth the trip? To where you don't feel dumb. What is Mars? What's going on there right now? Is it like uh, let's Antarctica? Say, let's, like, uh, like, uh, like, uh, yeah, the, well, there's there's a colonists there. Yeah, roughly, roughly in Arctic. Like, like you can. Th- there's enough of a of a burgeoning space economy that like you can plan your own day trips. And they've got you know they got a few rovers available for you, a few flying craft that you can go around, uh, a few few raw materials you can build something if you feel like it. Okay. Okay. Also, caveat. There's there's a certain industry that just had onerous legislation on their working practices in the Valley of Southern California that has uh, instead decided to relocate all their business to Mars. Oh, is that a specific reference you're making? <laughs> there's the whole uh, a the, the the porn industry just. Oh some, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> They're all like, hey, we're going bareback. We're going Mars. Screw you, pigs. <laughs> we're going to Mars. <laughs> Outbreak of STDs just <laughs> totally devastates the Mars colony. <laughs> Planet gonorrhea. <laughs> so, oh, where are you, Mars? Oh, oh. Uh, no, no, but I didn't. know. Oh, of course you didn't. Yeah, it's, sure it's, uh, who else goes to Mars? That's right. Why else do you go to Mars? They're like for legitimate scientific research. What? Well, we bet it was research. You bet we're making all sorts of discoveries and probes doing and... a little spelunking up there in the martian terrain <laughs> so so like if it's like antarctica kind of like i ain't going i mean unless if unless i could like i can could really contribute to some sort of scientific research because i know me i know me in like i like the great outdoors to an extent but unless you give me a purpose like oh we got to go find the collar from one of the yellowstone wolves we got to find it which i've done that's cool but if i just kind of like ah oh, yeah it's just kind of make your own time on mars i'd be there like two days i'd be like man this internet's slow <laughs> wow that's amazing like uh on the flip Being side honest. like uh, so like- so what but what what's the what is the line for which would have to be crossed what is what is the main line uh that has to be crossed before you're like all right mars let's party mcdonald's taco bell really wow <laughs> <laughs> This is uh, okay. On the flip side, and this isn't me, but um, uh, I just finished reading the book Ultra Marathon Man by oh. uh, uh, Dean, someone or other. Uh, this guy like runs, you know, hundred mile marathon, ultra marathons. He runs two hundred mile ultra marathons. He runs across Death Valley in the dead of summer. And one thing he did just to do it uh, was he got a small group, or a small group was getting together to do the world's first marathon to the South Pole. And they went down to Antarctica, and they had to wait for uh, three weeks to find a single day where the weather was uh, was fair enough over a 26-mile 20, stretch to go. And uh, every, a bunch of other people were like, well, I can't do it with, with shoes on. i got to do it with snowshoes. And he was the only one who ran in shoe shoes and is, uh, as of the, the publishing of the book, the only man to, to run a marathon ending at the South Pole. And uh, just to hear him describe, like, he's got annoyed millionaire tourists who uh, have paid, and they're annoyed because the DC-3 that they need to, to get from the base camp over to the drop-off to go to the South Pole is unavailable day after day because they're waiting for the right weather conditions. 
and uh, you know the stuff that they deal with in Antarctica, stuff like uh, having to make sure to sleep with your tube of toothpaste because if you don't, the next morning when you get out, it will be a brick and you won't be able to uh, to brush your teeth in the morning. It's it's unreal the commitment. Yeah, I had a, I had a friend that did a marathon, and not the South Pole one, but did a marathon in, in Antarctica, which was just amazing. But I read read up on some of the ultra marathon stuff too, and at first I'm like, man, that's really cool. But then you start reading about like. All of the foot care problems and stuff, the toenails that come off, and like at the end of these marathons, the euphoria sounds great, and they're like, "Oh yeah, you know, you're not going to be, you know, you're you're going to be hobbling for you know weeks or months or whatever else like that, and you know, your feet are torn apart, and it's really." And I'm like, "Oh, I, I'll prefer to read about it." Yeah, well, there, I think in the book he says uh, you're supposed to recover a day for every mile you race. So in the case of a marathon, you're supposed to spend 26 days recovering. And then, and of course, in an ultra marathon, that gets problematic when you've got fifty mile, hundred mile, hundred and fifty mile events where theoretically you have to recover for the rest of the year. Awesome. Well, so maybe at least we'll go to Mars. That's our plan for longevity. <laughs> That's all we got. <laughs> We're talking well, about thinking, old like, people, like, and hopefully like... they'll have a Taco Bell or else <laughs> Maine's chilling here in 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 you know L A. Well, I'm thinking, like, if you start doing that, like, sports could all of a sudden get really, really super violent. Sure. Oh, if you live forever and all of a sudden body death is just an inconvenience? Body loss? Felix Baumgartner, (laughs) guy used a suit to go do a reentry. Yeah, man. What a wuss. I'll 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 just back up my brain. I'll tie all the helium balloons I can find in my body and just go up forever until I hit space. And then I'll Very freeze. Cold now. I'll freeze with double middle fingers in the air, <laughs> and my corpse will fall down. Uh, your your corpse. By the way, in that in that culture, like what dandies do we look like in terms of what we find squeamish and too violent, yes. and the things that turn our stomach? Man, uh, it, uh, totally living in a Groundhog Day world. The problem. The only problem is with you wouldn't be able to remember. You wouldn't be able to remember your actual event of death. You would back up like right before it, I guess. I mean, unless you had like implants and that recorded real time. But would you want to remember your death? I don't know. That'd be messed up, man. That'd be weird. Well, time for a commercial break. And we're going to leave that there because we'll have... Sponsors, maybe. That's uh, 20, 21 minutes, 54 seconds, Justin, if you want to jot it down. We just had one come in, too. So, um, Ready? Mm-hmm. Here is something weird. And as of the recording of this podcast, I have still not been able to find an explanation. There was an explosion over the weekend in Indianapolis. Do you hear about this? No, I did not. So an Indianapolis neighborhood is still off limits while police try to figure out what caused a horrific explosion that killed two people and prompted nearly 200 residents to flee. With no hint of a problem advance, no telltale smell of a gas leak, the residents were all of a sudden frightened by the sound of an explosion and an entire, like, several houses been blown apart. No evidence of a meth lab, no evidence of a pipe leak. Again, they've gone over, tried to find any sort of pipe leak. They can't find any trace of that whatsoever. They brought in the ATF to go in and investigate. Windows and doors have been blown up. Houses have been blown apart. They're surprised that not more people died in this. So, okay, so if we're talking rough equivalent blast, are we talking Tunguska? Are we talking, um, uh, I don't know, like giant propane tank or propane factory explosion or what uh i mean yeah tunguska covered you know probably something the size of a state so that was way too big but this yeah. is a neighborhood just wiped out charred just we don't know and we don't know what caused it how many people died two people died and they the the authorities were amazed that more people did not it has everything if you're a conspiracy theorist tell me tell okay. me tell me it immediately got blamed on fracking like tell me somebody prematurely just announced it's got to be fracking and then John Krasinski yeah he's out he's gonna he's gonna crack this case uh I didn't hear anything about fracking and and let's <laughs> let's not enable anybody who's already jumping off <laughs> half cocked on that one uh so if you go take a look at Indianapolis explosion you can actually see it why don't you guys take a look there and we can we'll use the uh, theater of the mind 
All right, hold on. I'm typing in uh, Indianapolis Bullis Explosion. Oh, look at that. Finished it for me. Uh, massive Indianapolis Explosion baffles investigators. Holy cow! There, okay, it looks as though... All right, so picture picture your cookie-cutter neighborhood, your, your tiny ant-like conformity, as far as the eye could see. Picture one house... Is totally gone. Like there's just nothing but rubble there. Uh, the house to the left and to the right of it, one of them is mostly gone. The other one is about half gone. The house behind it, the backyard is destroyed and covered in rubble. And there are and, 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 and just to clarify, this rubble is splinters. It is boards, not pieces of 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 cool. wall. It yeah. is. It was like it was made out of toothpicks and blown apart. Yeah. Okay. This is like Michael Bay blowed up. Well, I mean, the first thing that pops into my mind is, uh, is you know, the scenario from Fight Club, where they say the pilot light goes out over the weekend. The entire house fills with gas. The compressor from the uh, from the refrigerator trips. The spark ignites everything. I feel like that would uh, that would look like it. Man, what a spectacular explosion. And, and you look at other be. photos, you see it's not but, just one house. It's there are houses in several directions got totally wiped out by it, this. Man. But isn't like the, the Fight Club thing, and not to offer any spoilers, but isn't that like not true? Well, it turns out that's not what happened, right? But, yeah. uh, but I mean, but like, is it's that. A, it's a plausible scenario. Is it a plausible scenario? Like, I mean, it is to me. <laughs> I mean, it sounds like it, you know, but I don't know if, if it is. I don't know. I mean, I I mean, I assume that that kind of science came from somewhere. Man, that guy is a beast. Yes, it, propane it is explosive. <laughs> <laughs> Doing my part. So it's it's one of those things where I was thinking that when I read this a couple of days ago, I'm like, I'll save this for today, but it'll probably be solved by now. No, but now it's still not solved. So so we got to figure. They definitely. I mean. People are saying, suggesting they think it's gas, but I mean, how would you check for it? I assume that there's some kind of signature. Man, I'll tell you what. Yeah, mm -hmm. look at the, this. The AP lead. Uh, a homeowner is saying a problem furnace could be to blame. That is the definition of, of a problem furnace. Huh? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> that is one problematic furnace. Oh, yeah, Fernie, I'll tell you what. Have you that, done it again? Problem with a capital P. Then the uh, the people who passed away, former honor, honor student, class officer, and track athlete. Uh, you know, it's just two people just gone, and they say eighty homes were affected by the damage. Wow, man! So I'm gonna, I'm, I'm hopefully going to see. I'm going to try to mute this so we can see just video of the visual. Okay, good. Uh, yeah, man. Uh, okay, so I mean, it's uh, you figure it's got to be. There's only one volatile explosive chemical that we pump into residential houses across America. Fluoride in your water. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, and it would be you have when you get explosions, people either think it's gas or it's a meth lab because the what you need to make a meth lab, the chemicals there are, are very, very explosive. And probably if I were to bet money on this, I would say uh for, like the furnace explanation or something that it was a, just a slow gas leak, not a not a mainline leak, but actually like a leak within the house that just continually built up over time until it just was ready to just explode. Yeah, I guess my question is like, how long does that take? Like, how is that is that weeks, months? Like, is that a year? You know, to to have things fill up to the point where it it goes boom like that. I, I would think like a week or so because beyond that, I mean you you, you got to have I mean it depends on how, you know, what kind of weather stripping you have through how weatherized your house is. And that's another thing. Indianapolis, they deal with real cold unlike us wussies in Texas and Florida. So it's like they probably have the place sealed up pretty well so that if it was leaking a gas on the inside, it's probably not all floating out. Look at this, man. You got you got buildings across the street where the garage door is dented in from where the debris hit and where there's uh there's there's tiles there's shingles ripped off the roof that's incredible 
That is crazy pants, McGirt. So, uh, okay. So, let's just, for discussion's sake, let's take natural gas off the table. What else? What else you guys got? Let's spitball some ideas. All right. <laughs> Flubber. <laughs> Flubber. An angry housewife. Uh, Jason Bourne. Uh, well, oh, I know. Um, somebody didn't want to actually set off a bomb, so they just threw a bunch of debris everywhere and said, "Oh, did you see that explosion?" And then, like, it's a cabal. It's like a secret uh, uh, conspiracy. And then they lit some fires. <laughs> Adolescent with mutant powers. Good. Hello. Hey, buddy. So, uh, was that a me thing? No, that was a me thing. That's a uh, my delightful disconnect. Um, uh, I took a second longer to to check on it because um, it looked like my phone is connected. My my phone is connected to the Wi-Fi, and uh, my phone was still able to access. So it's hard for me to say. It doesn't look like all the computers um, dropped off. Studio PC dropped off. Wondered who got hit by the random explosion. <laughs> Sorry, that's my uh, my delightful our audience just got hit with the random explosion of boredom. <laughs> yeah, because we were we were brought away from them, torn from our suckling teat. Of comedy okay. and insight. An insight. Sorry, man. It's not me. It's the mustache. <laughs> are we live? Yes, we are. Okay. Still worked. Okay. There's that. I have notified my secret helper who is trying to help me. All right, so uh, we were saying once we take uh, things off the table, is that what we're talking about? Yeah. yeah, so if you start thinking about what could cause an explosion like that, we get some crazy, like, random geothermal vent nobody thought about. Yeah. All of like, a sudden, I guess boom, it if, just if erupts. We're, yeah, if, if we're going with, like, crazy... I mean, I guess, like, if we're... we're I mean, it still would be a natural gas thing, but, like, remember that snake story we had a while ago where... It was just like the one house was just like under this like every seven years, like every snake within like, you know, 50 miles comes and gathers and rubs together in a, a little snake, snake snuggery. It would be oh, which by the way, remind me, remind me to talk about we have we have a development in, in, in the snuggery investigation. Oh, really? Oh, excellent. Snuggery update. We do. So we do. We have we have a snuggery update. Huh? And uh, so we'll close up the explosion thing, but uh, there is actually an exhaustive list put together in a research paper about likely impacts from meteors that have killed people or injured people. What? Yes. Like what? what and, when it says likely locations or likely scenarios? Well, when you're talking about something in 1420 BC in Israel, got it. But some of these are a little more recent. You've got, oh, in 1879 in Newtown, Indiana, a man killed in bed, apparently by a meteor. Uh, Tunguska, Siberia, oh, fire, two people killed. So that's, they think maybe two people died there when that happened. Um, 1946, Santa Ana, Mexico, houses destroyed, 28 injured. All right. Okay. If the president was killed by a meteor. And I'm not saying this president. I'm saying a president. An American president was killed by the meteor. Is that Alexander the, Hamilton. Is that is that the biggest news of the weird story ever? Like even more than like us like finding what we can classify as a Bigfoot or something. Nobody would believe it. Nobody would believe it. Oh yeah, no no no. Yeah, yeah. Look, we already have 
We we have an assassination where the assassin says, "Yes, I'm the one who shot the president," and then I did it. It was me with this gun from this place. Then from the training I received in your military that you know, right? I did it, right? Mm -hmm. And people can't accept that. What makes you think they're going to accept? What about the guy with the umbrella standing on the hill? So you're saying that it would be it would it would dwarf the Kennedy assassination and conspiracy theories if it's like like are we really to believe that a meteor came down from space and killed the president? Yes, exactly. Brian and I would be saying that. <laughs> yeah. We'd be doing the internet show all about called "Do We Really Believe?" Yes, yes, that's exactly the case. I'm just saying that the official story leads us down the path of the first time ever a meteor has killed a head of state. So it's like uh, there's this there's this trade-off between amount of credible evidence versus weirdness of the killing. So it's like you got, you know, an assassination is, is certainly an, an unusual event. Uh, but, you know, you have a case where, where you only have a few photographs and there's a Bruder film, right? Maybe maybe occasional other things. So not very well covered, but not too remarkable of a, of an assassination as far as assassinations go. So so, but even then, there's enough for people to disbelieve it. Then you got something like 9/11, which is crazy well documented, crazy yeah. from all the angles, from everything, right? Crazy well documented. But on the flip side, it's a much more odd killing right so so it's a much more unusual event so that trade-off even though you've got much much more footage it's that much more weird which causes you know the i don't know man maybe it's an inside job you get you get that but i'm telling you and and a meteor strike like there's there's no way there does not exist enough cameras on planet earth that even if they were all there on the day of all pointed from all angles still nobody would believe it I wouldn't believe it. You know, like he's the only one that got so hit. Saying, the only person that got hit in president. I'd be like, all right, all right. There's front page USA Today. Uh, the picture of the meteor uh, after it's been taken from the wreckage. Headline: Rock of Ages, which is a tasteless headline, <laughs> but they ha have it anyway. Uh, uh, you don't believe it? It's there. No, I mean uh, the, it, the maybe, footage but clearly maybe shows some space the meteor coming in used to target him. So hey, that would actually just be randomly... the best part of those conspiracy theories is that did you know that six months ago the CIA started a, a program called Rock you, Throwers? Dude, but uh, dude, no lie, like I I've read the Moon is a harsh harsh mistress. I mean that's all too. You get a super intelligent, uh, you know, trajectory calculating artificial intelligent. It could just kind of knock it from space, land it on a on a head of state's head. Well, that's hard, though, because of atmosphere, but... Well, I mean, you know, you got to compensate for the chaos. You... Yeah, it's, 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 <laughs> the chaos it continues even after the trajectory. Yeah, well, you just So gotta, Brian has our first argument you, on... You gotta... Do we really believe? <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. By the way, uh, oh, and real quick, just to go back to why I was talking about the, the snake house with the with the explosion thing, like I I do like the craziest natural scenario would be like either like what Andrew said that there's just this this crazy thermal vent that just randomly opened up in this suburban Indiana neighborhood, or, Portal to hell. or that it was just some kind of crazy like natural uh you know like gas reserve or something that that at some point play, factored into uh. To this, uh, to this, uh, you know, explosion. But mad scientists working that would on warp be... drive. Yes, poltergeist house. Man, these are the good. Earth farting. <laughs> troll, troll, imposter president. I don't know. Does this does this mean anything? <laughs> Let's go to commercial. Uh, forty minutes, fifty four seconds, Justin. Okay. Gentlemen, I want to have update. a couple other items here, but I think it's time for a snuggery update. Snuggery update. Bust out the snuggery. I've received for, the for, like, just for those of you who didn't tune in last episode, last episode on the thrilling edition of Weird Things, <laughs> we brought up this woman who had a most peculiar occupation. She was a professional snuggler. Cuddler. I yes. believe it was cuddler. 
Well, she, and she works in a place Huddle. called the Snuggery. And there was some snickering here. Snugger, some snuggery some, sniggerers. Some snay snares. <laughs> <laughs> who snidely suggested <laughs> there was some sort of snexual overtone. Snexual overtones. <laughs> Specifically, you said that there's no there. There was, I, I believe, the figure ninety eight percent sexual was was yes. thrown out by what Justin Roberts. My, my point, person my, said my that. point was that it was ninety eight percent of their customers. Uh, that has <laughs> did you say ninety eight percent? A just sexual that. element is factored in more so <laughs> than a massage uh, into ninety eight percent. That there is a sexual component, maybe not totally sexual. Snexual. I'm not saying that they would all proposition her for sex. I'm saying that there is a sexual Snex. component right. to it. Well, and and by the way, ninety uh, that, that that was the real genius. It was ninety eight percent had a sexual component, and then sexual component was went on to be defined as not having any biological sexual response or. It, it, it was like it was like uh, if if I remember correctly, your definition included like. Like uh, maybe not even thinking about anything sexual, but but it was sexual. No, at the same time. that's all right. No, no. Listen, you would yeah, a classic brushwood move. You go in later and just defame me. Um, <laughs> no, it, it is it is for a there is a, a a sexual gratification if even uh, mentally. That that you are you are doing something that is that is how, normally how associated with, with sex. Is that form of sexual gratification if it's purely <laughs> mental? That sounds like the opposite of gratifying. Uh, a, all right, I want to hear I, the news. Listen, people get off in different ways, man. <laughs> there's there's crazy ways people get off. All right, so let me get to our update. Uh, high jury. I'm a guy located in Rochester, and I had been toying with the idea of going to the snuggery ever since I heard about it a month ago, pretty much for the exact reason Brian was saying on the podcast. Uh, well, I made the, the appointment for this Thursday. I figured you might be interested to know that one of your own is going to be patronizing the service you spent 20 minutes or so talking about. Also, if you're interested, I'd be happy to write up a short piece about my experience anonymously. I'd rather not my name be associated with this forever. Uh, I figured you guys might be curious to hear a first-hand account. Let me know, Jim Schwartz. No, I'm <laughs> <laughs> two, two, oh. one, Rooster Creek, Rochester, um, New York. Uh yes, this so is very amazing. Too. And he is not. We, we had mentioned before, uh, Rabbit Badger, who is a, a huge fan of Weird Things and NSFW show, and uh, hopefully at this point has at some point. Uh, washed off the uh, champagne and, uh, and and rested his hand from high fiving after Obama got reelected, um, but uh, if, if this is not him. He made a point to say that that uh, he, that there are more than one. He said, "P.S. I'm not Rabbit Badger. Believe it or not, there are more than <laughs> one of us living in this Arctic hell hellscape." <laughs> Dude, uh, are you kidding me? This would be amazing to have original reporting live on the scene, undercover investigations. Is so it? I'm is it sexual? Into the quilt right now. She's making some tea. <laughs> We're talking about our relatives. Yes. It turns and like, out. Right, and here's my point. To, to, to the sexual element. The only other context we have for snuggling is usually in a. A sexual manner as an adult. This, you, you, uh, this you word we. Have sex and you snug. This word we. I don't think you're using it the way the word we works. This is. Uh, I, I think. The, I think you meant the are word. Are you not I. saying that's that? Are you not saying that the act of cuddling is a, a something that happens in the process of a sexual encounter? So Justin apparently, when the, he would knock on his mom's door at night because he was scared, <laughs> which she would say, "Go away." <laughs> yeah, maybe, uh, I'm not. I'm not saying solely. Awkward, although I will Justin. say, through the majority of our lifetime, at a certain point, there is a tipping point for which any cuddling you might have done as a kid is outweighed the cuddling that you do as as an adult, which has a different sexual content. Right, how how do you do, how do you explain the fact that my my five year old just asked me to cuddle with her? Like, what was going on? What was that? What was that like for me? Okay. Then let's then let's if you're if you're going to be if you're going to be sticklers about this then let's say non familial cuddling for which this is unless you're related to the snuggery lady, <laughs> right? Uh, 
uh, I I what hear am- what you're saying. Well, I mean, I'm we've just saying, what what other it's... non-familial cuddling is not sexual on some level? But we've already defined, well, hopefully, and we've defined an exception. We've already defined an exception where that kind of contact is not sexual in nature. Are you saying that's the only situation now? Wait, that, wait, I mean, that people hypothetically, this... let's say a grown adult man had a stuffed animal. Maybe it looked like a gorilla or a monkey. <laughs> let's say this man... <laughs> Let's say this man on a cold Florida winter night. <laughs> just wanted, or Las Vegas night. Or Las Vegas night. <laughs> just wanted to get warm. Cuddle up just, with just, it. It's a, it's a comfort blanket of sorts. Is that? Is that sexual? Uh, for a stuffed animal? Is that what we're talking about? Really? We're, we're at the, we're at the, is it okay to cuddle with a stuffed animal We're trying thing? to find out because you started with this very sweeping 98% of the time we point out, oh, what if your child? Well, okay, that's no, no, different. No, 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 listen, the, again, the distortions. <laughs> this is, <laughs> oh, I said 98% way. of her, her customers, her customers have a sexual component for wanting to go to the snuggery. Not all cuddling is, is sexual the 98 percent of cuddling that's a distortion from your mouth <laughs> no i never said that you said that you said 98 percent. well no he, he of said 98 percent of her customers of, of her customers we're going did you ask the uh the the person the the uh emailer jim well, schwartz he already said phone if, number he, uh, 422 yeah jim jim schwartz uh already said i really hope his jim, name is jim Dr. schwartz said i mean and just, and just what he wrote and we will be communicating with them and yes, Jim, uh, you are welcome to write about it uh, on the site. Of course, please, you can stay. Please, uh, we, we are we are begging you to lend credence to this, up to and including. Is there at any point a gopher launch moment, and what is her reaction? <laughs> so, is we what I want to know first? What is his expectations going in there? Is yeah. it, why does he? What's, why is he curious what, to? Know, and I'm I'm curious because in it is not a judgmental way. We will make jokes, of course, but. And all sincerely, in the breadth of human experience, we want to know what is his his is it curiosity? Is it this? Is it like, hey, I'm gonna be kind of fun? I you know haven't been with you know a woman in a while and just missed that part of it. Is it that? Is it maybe he's like, well, you know, maybe there is something more to it. One of that too. Uh, and curious to know the reasons going in there. And then yes, did it move? I'm telling you, man. Beyond yeah. uh, uh, divorced from the sexual component. When you hug another human being, uh, especially especially if you're a single uh, person, man or woman, who, who just day-to-day don't touch many other people, uh, when you hug someone, you get, you get a giant flood of endorphins, not, not sexual, but, but just good feelings from touching another person. we got to bring then, Paul Zak in on this. Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely, right? We should. We should totally hit him we up bring, on that. We can bring, and I'm gonna we say, bring Paul Zak. I'm going to say, like, there are people who are like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to snuggle with somebody and I'm going to be floating for the next two days feeling like I'm a worthy individual who doesn't need to, uh, you know. Can I, can right, I ask a question? Hold on. One, one final question just to button this up. Sure. Brian, no, no, I got another somebody... question. You don't button this up. Okay. Then, no, I'm sorry. I thought you were trying to move on. You get, you get last word. Uh, it, 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 it's the Bill O'Reilly move. I'll give you the last word. Um, Brian, you yeah. are somebody who patronizes massages a lot, right? You're on the road a lot. You you are you are a big believer in in the therapeutic element of massage. You know, right? Brian, about that trip to Thailand where you rented out that whole hotel suite. You yeah. told us about that, right? Well, yeah, and and a lot of that comes from uh, uh, from Dennis Rogers, just because you sleep, you get all twisted up and all that stuff. But I'll be honest, part of it is just like it it feels it it does feel good to be touched by another human being. That's uh, for damn sure. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, if you told Bonnie that you had a gig in Rochester and you were going to the snuggery, is she okay with that? Oh, that's an interesting reversal. What a good reframe. Um, yeah. Uh, I have a reframe on the reframe. Okay. Let me hear your reframe on the reframe. Well, hold on. All right. But then you have to answer both. Okay. So what if, wait, did he go answer a phone? No, no, so, no, no. He's here. Sorry, I kicked over something. So, so hypothetically, Justin, you and your girlfriend have intimate talk, okay? What yeah. if you discussed those intimate things with another woman? How would you feel? 
if if I discussed our intimate details with another woman, I guess I guess Andrew's feel? yeah Andrew's point appears to be that um, that just because uh, it would be disallowed by your relationship doesn't necessarily mean it's sexual. Because there's lots of things that Bonnie wouldn't allow me to do on the road. Would that be crossing a line? <laughs> yeah. For, for me to discuss what we've talked about with somebody else, would she? Would, is like, the answer? Do I find it to be crossing a line, or would, would she, she, she feel like would that in a relationship would that be considered out of bounds to discuss sex things like that with another woman? <sighs> I, I mean, between between us, they're probably not as much. <laughs> um. <laughs> or, or in, in with girlfriends in the past. Well, I'll tell like, you. I'll past. tell you this. It really depends on. What I mean, would, well, I, it would depend on what the conversation specifically would be about and whether or not it was embarrassing. Yes. And really, I mean, the, the line for embarrassment is different for each person. So let's say. So you would say that there are cases where it would be okay. There might be. Yes. Yes. What if it was your court-appointed psychologist? I, then I don't. I don't think that it would be. I mean, like if it's if so I, a professional, there, there are context okay. for it, and I think that there were probably if 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 because uh, like, there is an element to the snuggery, the fact that it is just a homegrown lady with a with a bed, you know, uh, that it's not something that has been done for fifty years. There's an element to that context for which I don't think we can just completely separate. That, that you can't just call her a court appointed psychologist. It's called the snuggery. <laughs> That's about as legit as you're gonna get. Yeah. In my yeah, imagination. Yeah, and there are there are fancy names like the Moonlight Bunny Ranch. Uh, in my imagination, she's got a sign, and the snuggery is uh, like hand painted in clouds, like you'd see at a nursery or something. The snuggery with bears, and I, I see balloons. It's got reason. a website, thesnuggery.org. No way. Go into the website right now. Hold on. They have the double cuddle, cuddle, allows clients to cuddle with two cuddlers concurrently. What? I bet the double cuddle would be awesome. I would feel very appreciated. Why snuggle? Quite simply, because it makes us feel good. Research provides us with ample evidence that physical contact with others has a positive effect on physical and mental health. Dude, I'll tell you what. Think about it this way. Wait, Q and A. What happens if I become sexually aroused during my session? Oh, Q and A. Yes. Answer. Don't worry. It happens. Exclamation point. Although sexual, ninety-eight percent of the time. Uh, although sexual <laughs> activity is not permitted, arousal is perfectly normal and should not make anyone feel uncomfortable. Um, I may be flipping my opinion on this. <laughs> <laughs> Do clothes pajamas always stay on for the duration of the session? Absolutely. Nudity is not permitted. Am I supposed to talk during my session? Uh, wow. Do I have to tip? Of course you don't have to tip, but we're... No, but apparently she won't kick you out of bed if you do. <laughs> she has a bachelor's in brain and cognitive science. And the other one has a degree in music therapy, and she plays the glockenspiel. <laughs> really? <laughs> That's epic. Uh, look, man. Sounds like they should be on tour with the double clicks. Let's just let's just uh, let's just leave it up to our in the field reporter to explain what this what the experience was like. Yeah, I can't. Yeah, I, right. I, it's not the whole reason. It's just a reason. I'm not saying that it can't be contained. And there can be a therapeutic element to it, but. There is there is an element that is undeniably sexual, I think, for the vast majority of her customers. Ninety-eight percent, huh? College town, Rochester. Gotta wonder though, like what's uh what's going right for a hooker there? In Rochester? I don't know, man. Probably less than we might think. Yeah, I'm saying so, you know, sixty bucks for a snuggle and to maybe try to, you know. But you know, but a lot of I don't think a lot of guys will want a hooker. You know, there's a what lot, of, a lot of social road? baggage that comes with a hooker. I got nothing. Yeah. All right. <laughs> we uh, defer to your experience on that. 
<laughs> I'm just it would it would it seems to me like there is if we're if we're looking at the grand scheme of ways that you can be sexually gratified for money that on that road there is a there is a gap between the snuggery and and a hooker but it is still on the same road. All right. Mm, interesting. <laughs> what else you said you so had some would, other What tidbits? would you say wait but is that is that a thumbs up or thumbs down from Bonnie? We need to find out from Bonnie whether or not you're allowed to go to the snuggery, Brian. Yeah, we the need next to, time we that you know. go to the Rochester Institute right, of Technology, I'll, I'll, I'll bring perform. that back. I'll bring back my. Uh, uh, I'll tell you what. Here's my undercover investigation. I'll just bring it up and say, <laughs> and just act like, yeah. So I was thinking about going to uh, this, uh, this is sn- just snuggery. <laughs> just gonna go to the snuggery. <laughs> is this one of Andrew and Justin's stupid ideas? No, I've I've got a show in Rochester, and um, and then I'll be like, fine, go, just go. You'll get that. Just go, kind of that. Just go. And then what? And then I'm not telling you. And then no, what? I think I think I think if Bonnie if Bonnie wasn't cool, then I think Bonnie's the time to shut it down. <laughs> I'm just saying, is like Bonnie? Brian Bonnie will might- turn that key. <laughs> I'm just saying that Brian's going to come home and he's going to wake up with a bill next to his bed. Yeah. <laughs> it's eight hours, $60 an hour, Brian. That is $480 you owe me, plus tip. And let's just say oh. there will be hefty penalties assessed for you not following the stated guidelines on New <laughs> Day. There is a, there is a strict policy. Amazing. You should see the instant financial uh, the financial assessment triggered for impregnation as well. <laughs> yeah, man, nine I'm months of having to that cuddle one. that thing. <laughs> All right, did you say you had some other stuff, Andrew? Uh, do you want to go to picks? Yeah, actually, I yeah. Let's go to Brian. What's the what's the oh, time code? Time code is fifty eight seventeen. I actually have a pick that I'm way excited about. Well, in that case, Justin, you go first. <laughs> All right, not a sci-fi pick uh, this week, although I am uh, finishing up the Thrawn trilogy, which uh, is amazing and awesome, and I love it, and I love the reader. Again, if you've read the Thrawn trilogy and you love it, you owe it to yourself to listen to these audio versions. Uh, the the uh, the reader is so awesome. The sound design is so great, and all it does is now this is the first one that I've read knowing that we live in a universe where there is going to be more Star Wars movies. And uh, it just is, it makes me more excited than I was before when I was extraordinarily excited. So I'll have a review on that uh, next week, probably when I'm finished with it. However, the non-sci-fi pick is that I've been catching up with uh, the HBO series that ended this year, Eastbound and Down, starring uh, Danny Danny McBride, McBride, uh, written by uh, Jody Hill. Uh, and directed by a bunch of episodes. I am, I so love this series. And I think from a storytelling perspective, it really is one of the more, uh, you know, daring kind of, of comedies to have somebody that is so, in, you know, so simultaneously unlikable, awful, selfish, and yet completely, uh, you know, open and, and vulnerable. And just this, like this, squishy mass of just uh you know uh, i guess he doesn't know who he is it, it, this this self-loathing and lack of self-confidence that just manifests itself in these or awful and horrible and selfish ways so uh check it out it is it is really really funny and also you know danny mcbride playing the role of kenny powers or danny mcbride i don't assume that he's really any different than than kenny powers seeing as every other role that he has is kind of Kenny Powers esque. Sure. But uh but but check it out. It is it is super, super hilarious. Uh the writing is amazing. And, and uh the cameos are just just great. Every time that there's another, you know, like, oh, somebody that's like important to the plot, they just did such a great job casting, including uh Will Farrell in a doing a Ric Flair impression, which is uh amazing. That's awesome. Uh I wanted to recommend the Walking Dead, not that television show, and not that comic book. Well, Brian, that's it. What other forms of media could there possibly be? Oh, Andrew Maine, 
You've the forgotten, DVDs. You've forgotten about the realm of interactive imagination. Uh, the uh, Telltale Games came out with uh, a, uh, or they're coming out with. They got four parts out, and they got a fifth episode on the way, uh, te- uh, based on the comic book video game version of The Walking Dead, uh, and it's exquisite. I've actually been live streaming my playthroughs of the first uh, few episodes. Uh, we did episode one and episode two, and. Uh, they are, you know, there, there are elements of it that occasionally get a little bit slightly actiony, like when a zombie jumps out and grab you, you know, it's sort of, you know, it says like hit Q to shake him off, and then you you hit Q, panicked, and then, but uh, really the bulk of the storytelling is in the uh, uh, the dialogue options. Unlike, and I don't think I've ever seen this before, uh, in all of the dialogues, remaining silent is a viable option that you're allowed to do, so that whenever someone asks you a question, you have one of three or four different responses, but you also have a timer bar that goes down to zero. So it adds this element where you can't think about it. You can't decide how you feel about something. You have to go with your gut in your reaction. You're either going to, you're either going to tell the truth or you're going to lie. You're either going to say this girl's your daughter, or you're going to admit that, you know, you, you rescued her from a house somewhere. And, and uh, you find yourself in complicated situations because every character remembers what you said to them. And if you get caught in a lie, that's problematic. Uh, and there are occasionally the same kind of agonizing decisions that have to be made that you see in the television show and that you see in the comic book. But it is fundamentally different when you're the person who has to make that agonizing decision. And uh, and especially when you have to live with the consequences and knowing that it will sincerely piss off and estrange certain parts of the bar. I mean, I'm not going to say what, uh, but at one point in the game, you uh, zombies attack and you have to ah, decide. Spoiler. You have to decide which of, of two people you're going to rush to help. And you do not have a lot of time to decide. And you, you dive over and do it. Uh, it's it's phenomenal. Uh, I'm only two episodes in. From what I hear, people are saying that the situations they face in episode four had them bawling in front of their computer, which it's like, and that's that's the final frontier with video games uh, of the emotions to to evoke. Uh, the the easiest is fear because you just throw a scary face and a surprise, which is why twenty years ago you would see stuff like Doom coming out, where you know you'd be like, "Oh, this is awesome! I'm feeling something," and then you know you, you feel elation and joy. Uh, but I've never really had a game, you know, sweep me up and get me totally crying because I believed in the characters and situations. And it sounds like The Walking Dead might be the one to do it. So uh, it's the way I think it's only twenty bucks on Steam and. You uh, get all five episodes. Four of them are released. The fifth one, I believe, comes out later this month. Ethical question. Surprise weird things question. Video games are getting more sophisticated, more processing power. If we go look at our Moore's Law, we look at our graph, we're going to see a point where you're actually going to be able to buy the equivalent of a human brain in transistors. Sure. And I don't know when that's going to be. But I think it's within 20 years' time. That'll that'll be a thing. And whether or not that makes it intelligent or human is a totally different thing. But we're going to get to a point where those characters that you're playing are going to have very complex systems, very, very complex algorithms and be able to behave. Already game, video games can play, behave in ways that the creators did not anticipate. You see that with first with swarming behavior. We saw whole, you know crowds and swarms in video games start to behave and do flocking behaviors that the programmers didn't anticipate. It was just this emergent property of a complex system. As you start building these artificially intelligent systems that learn, as you point out, remember what you say. Uh, real quick side note, you know the marshmallow test with kids? Where oh, they yes. test patients of kids? And so it's a classic test where they ask a kid, like, would you like one marshmallow now or would you like to have two in 15 minutes? And... Researchers say this is a great example of showing kids, you know, who are impatient versus kids who are patient. The ones that waited, you know, turned to later on have much better uh, delayed gratification. Well, new research has pointed out that there's a big critical flaw in that study, which was been long ignored. And that is, what are you measuring? This child's patience or this child's faith and confidence in the researchers that he will actually get those two marshmallows later on. Right. And they find out that the kids that go for them now, very often they're from environments where, you know, the parents will, I'll give you, no, I changed my mind. I didn't 
think that you behaved well, and they're hedging their bets. I'm like, if I take this marshmallow now, I know I get a marshmallow. If I wait 15 minutes, and researchers just assume. But anyhow, those are things you don't anticipate. You create a study, you create research, and you do this, and then you have this sort of, you know, it's one of the things in parenting, consistency is extremely important. Children who come from inconsistent households Mm -hmm. have problems later on. So these are the kind of little things that come into play that you don't really think about that can create emergent behaviors. And so in video games, like you're talking about, we're going to get to a point where they're going to get much more complex. You play video games now where you have your the your opponents will all of a sudden learn from what you're doing, adapt novel strategies, and as they get more and more intelligent, when do we get into an ethical thing like you're talking about in a Walking Dead game where you're going to kill off a character? Oh, where you feel morally. Uh, so so let's say, let's say, I mean, we, we always see this story played out in you know, uh, movies and books like iRobot, where it's just like, you know, ethically, you've got a sentient being that wants to continue to live. You shut them down. We said we always see it with physical robots. But what happens when we create multiple sentient entities within a video game? Which will happen first. Yeah. Wow. That's interesting. Um, I mean, I guess I'm going to. Is s- there an ethical point at which turning off the game is unethical, is immoral? Or, I get, or, you know, what if... I, we laugh, we, we look back at how people treated animals a long time ago. You know, throw a sack of kittens into the water. It's the humane thing to do. You know, right. oh, watch these bears fight dogs. Ah, ha, ha, they're just bears. You, well, I'm, you, I have this complex video game that has more neurons than my average household pet. And I'm going to kill the character, shut it down. Well, do you want, you want, you want to know what I think the difference might be? Is if we start to do it and we find out that our experience experiences are different and therefore each uh, you know each version of it is unique that it, it's not just the same program that we are turning on and off that we think of it being off as its sleep or its rest but each incarnation of those characters or that experience well, is it, unique they are now though in, in in a way yeah so so imagine imagine you first load the game and you get a kind of a, a tabula rasa blank character that asks questions, that plays chess with you, that interacts with you for a period of five, six, seven years, to where by the time it's it's uh, by the by that moment, you have uh, what appears to be a a fully interactive, you know, and, and let's say it's just a, a bot running around in World of Warcraft, right? It's a software engine that interacts in the world. And maybe people know it's a bot or don't know it's a bot, but regardless, its being is shaped by the people it interacts with, and it's able to tell stories about people that. Have met at places it went and things it did it's it gets cheerful it has like, friends it, it gets yeah it gets cheerful you know it follows up with you in the real world asking what you're up to i mean because think about how many of our friendships through the internet we never meet these people in physically in in meat space but we we believe they're real because of the uh you know and, and we believe in their friendships you know it's like there are so many people that i know from doing stuff like the weird things podcast that uh, these are precious relationships to me, uh, and then uh, and then to pull the plug on them, would that be an ethical thing? I don't know. It, it, I would say I would say this: it is exactly as ethical a dilemma as taking a razor blade to the Mona Lisa is. It is. It would be tragic, uh, and feel wrong. But the only reason is is for what what it represents or for what it comes to mean. But how do you know, how do you know any other being experiences pain? Uh, Uh, Because it skirts away from physical harm or reacts differently when pain occurs. Well, programs and robots do that now. Yeah. Wow. That's interesting. So, and I'm, I'm not saying that, we're supposed to have a clear cut answer because I I don't I genuinely don't and I think that there's there's uh there's whole schools of philosophy that go into this and uh, Daniel Dennett one of my favorites talked about that and one of the arguments he's discussed is the idea that uh you know where do you 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 have we want to show sympathy for organisms as we should and even small things mice whatever what have you and even insects. If you take your arm, your arm has more nerves in it than many forms of life that we generally, a, a humane person tries to be sympathetic towards. We don't anesthetize the arm if, you know, to prevent it from feeling pain. We anesthetize our brain so we don't feel the pain it experiences. And we could say because there's no centralized system. But when you start to get into things that have a memory and have this, 
you know, when you're shooting at that video game character, there comes a point where if we just measure pure neurons yeah. to transistors, which they're not the same, but we'll just pretend for the moment. Well, and this is also something that was covered in Steven Pinker's book, uh, the, Better Angels, or the Better Angels of Our Nature, where he talks about uh, it's not just our, you know, first it was uh, the massive decrease in violence against other men. But then we saw, uh, you know, uh, then we saw that expand or what was considered you know, men in the in the you know the racist slavery days, and then eventually you know like oh hey look look uh, you know slaves are men too. What how about that? And then hey guess what, women are human too. And then uh, and then you know and then children. And then we saw see a decrease in child abuse. And then we see that expand to uh, animal rights to where now we we are seeing and you know not not even as a as a joke. He talks about movement among fly fishermen to just get rid of the hooks. They're like look you're just gonna. Just gonna give back the fish anyway. Just you know, fit, fly fish without the hook, you get the nibble, and you know what would have happened next. And uh, and there are people who report that it's you know just about as satisfying as it was before. Uh, now whether or not that's that there obviously to most of us that seems silly right now, but will that seem silly in another twenty years? And obviously you know the idea of protecting a a semi sentient computer algorithm seems silly to us now, but will that seem silly in fifty or eighty years? Precisely. I think that it's a, you know, as you just described, how we expand. And one of the things that happens, too, is that we look back and we don't understand racism. We think it's stupid and it was and all that. But we look back at, let's say, the Greeks and the Chinese and other groups that have looked apart. Everybody around them is total barbarians. The Greeks, because they had a high level of civilization, they had language, they had culture, they had all these things. And the people around them were living closer in their minds to animal level than to human level. Mm -hmm. And these Germanic tribes didn't appear to have much culture compared to them. They, they lived like bears in the woods, so to speak. And when you have people in instances of slavery where you take one group of people, deny them education, deny them the ability to form their own cultural alliances, their own marriages, all these other things, and you forget those are the things that make us contribute to the aspects of civil, the humanizing aspects of civilization – People for the longest time perpetuated this idea that these people are subhuman, which in fact, you know, and that, that's a thing that's gone through when the Romans had slaves. You know, it's a very similar thing. And Romans had slaves, et cetera, you know, because these people were illiterate, they weren't educated, whatever, and it was a way to say this is why we're different. And they're not even capable of this. But then you start to realize that, well, no, they are. And so these things change over time. And even today we have certain biases that that we we tend to, even amongst people, that we tend to sort of forget about and you know, there's certain groups of people that are still, it's not quite falling in out of, you know, political correctness to make fun of. Right. And because, and but even though the, you know, whether it's somebody, you know, we use, trail, you know, for expressions like, you know, trailer park, you know, or rednecks and things like that and a lot of different connotations, but access to education, cultural relevance of education, all these things play into that. And we still make these little judgments and I think that's going to be the things you pointed out that's going to be the thing of the future is this. Are we going to look back with the frame of reference of the future and say, well, you know, maybe maybe Pac-Man had a soul. Some rudimentary version of it, sure. All right, you got a pick for us, Andrew? I got a pick. I got two picks. Uh, real quick, first one is uh, I've been playing this. It's addictive. I love it. I finished it. Now I'm going back to try to do better at it. Angry Birds Star Wars. Really? Oh, it's fun. It's fun. It's just the way they imagined the Angry Birds in the Star Wars universe, the Han Solo character, the Chewbacca, all of it is just just delightful fun. If you like Angry Birds and you like Star Wars, very, very enjoyable fun. Uh, the way they just tried to create the different worlds set within there from Tatooine all the way to the Death Star, recommend it. And then a Netflix, and it's available on like, every single platform, which makes it even better. So I've been playing it on my iPad. But my other pick is a Netflix Watch Now, Watch Instant streaming pick. And that is a documentary about Mr. Woody Allen. Oh, wow. It's a two-parter. It's still available if you just look up Woody Allen. Very, quite recent. was done, I think, just a year ago. And a lot of access to his sister, to Woody Allen, to his friends, his coworkers, everybody about that. And they cover his whole life. They go over a little bit into the Soon Yi thing. Not heavily, but you, you, know, you get sort of that perspective on that. But it's about... Woody Allen from birth all the way forward to you know who he was as a creator, all the movies he's done. He just realized the body of work, and he's a guy that you start to think, well, maybe his best movies are behind him, and then he comes out and does something like Match Point or Midnight in Paris, and you realize this guy's still got a lot of talent and is doing amazing work even to this day. He does a movie every year. 
Yeah, which movie a year, man. That's that's an insane output. And he was a magician when he was a kid, too, by the way. I don't know if you knew that. No, I did not know that. Magician, he would have his little sister. The way he would use his little sister is he'd have his little sister go, oh, look at his left hand, while Woody was using his right hand to do something. So always playing the angles. That's awesome. What's the name of it? A Woody Allen, a documentary? Yes. Okay. Yeah, here we go. I just found it. So there you go. Woody Allen, a documentary. That's awesome. And now, wow, that was just last year, huh? Highly recommend it. Right on. I oh, think yeah, that may a, be my favorite beast. thing. Just a beast of a human. I think that's my favorite thing about Netflix is how the barrier to, like, I just get so wound tight about the risk of investing myself in movies, uh, not just for, you know, for for the financial investment, because what's a couple bucks, but you just don't want to feel like a dupe who who threw your money at something and then wasted your time. And Netflix instant streaming just makes it to where like I can watch something that's genuinely terrible and feel good about it because somehow it doesn't feel like I spent anything. I don't feel like I cast my dollar vote and that, you know, I made the world worse as a result. Well, I'll just snuggle out outlook. those anxieties, Brian. Next time you're in Rochester. <laughs> I got to work that out with Bonnie. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us on Do You Really Believe? (laughs) (laughs) Say it. You got to say it. It's been weird. Do you really believe? Do you really think it was weird? Do you really think it was that weird? Save copy as. Peter Burp. 12. 11. 12. Do you really think? Awesome. At the snuggery. Take a break. Have a snuggle. Yeah. Hey man, do we have a uh, do we have a plan for tomorrow, Justin Robert Young? Plan. Plan. Uh, I mean, no. If the <laughs> if the question is, have we come up with a plan previous to now? The answer is no. Yeah. All right. But do you do you feel like? See, the thing is, this is a philosophical question. Maybe the plan's always been in there. Have we uncovered the plan? Maybe yeah, we've can, had a can plan. Can you say that we will, I mean, it would be it would be asinine to say that we are going to invent the plan between now and uh, now and the show. No, it's got to be. The Cylons had a plan. <laughs> oh, did they? <laughs> well, I mean, because you would say that, that that would be a wholly original thought that we're inventing, you know, which, which you have to assume through the, the uh, all the years of, of human cultural history, somebody will have had at least some form of the thoughts we will have between now and again. We are just rediscovering them. They already exist, Brian. This is Joe. Yes, you are correct, sir. Man, I'm almost out of room on this drive. I'm going to have to get a new new hard drive. 60 gigabytes free out of 2 terabytes, and that's all just content we've created since the studio PC. Uh, well, for... Uh, Do you really believe? Do you really believe? <laughs> Do you really believe? By the way, there so, uh, is an awesome Price cheater. Skyfall? No, but I hear it was amazing. Uh, I did. I saw Skyfall. How was it? Me and Andrew talked about it a little. Message. Uh, I liked it. I liked it a lot. I thought it was good. It's certainly very, very, very much uh, uh, worth seeing. It is a good Bond movie. Uh uh, what's his face uh, is Javier Bardem is an uh, awesome Bond villain, um, but uh, I I do think I, I can understand why people would find it underwhelming compared to the hype that uh, it it is not the same movie as Casino Royale nor does it deliver I think in the same way that Casino Royale does um, in terms of where the high points of the movie are, but uh, I I very 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 much enjoyed it. 
Yeah, I, so. I certainly enjoyed it. I, I don't think it had the same reaction that I had when I saw Casino Royale. I'm like, finally, we're getting the kind of Bond movies I want to see. Uh, I, I really enjoyed, but again, absolutely enjoyed it. Loved it. If you like Bond, go see. I loved. I lo- let me make it clear. I love. I love Skyfall. Was it so? When you hear like best one in years, I'm like, I don't think it was. I put it in Skyfall, and, and sir, I think I may have liked Skyfall better. And I got to go back and watch. Or excuse me, I like. I think I like Casino Royale better, and I got to go back and watch it. But uh, either of you guys certainly see those are two great entries into the Bond franchise, and show that 50 years later, it's still got life. Did uh, Did either of you guys see Quantum of Solace? Yes. I did not. It was not good, in my opinion, compared yeah. to the other ones. <laughs> uh, I saw Wreck-It Ralph. Do you do- Shrek-It Ralph? I have not seen uh, Shrek-It Ralph. That's pretty funny. <laughs> I hadn't really thought about that before. Um, I don't know if it's a Shrek clone. Uh, you know, yeah. unloved big guy wants to fit in. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed I enjoyed Wreck It Ralph. Yeah. Uh dude, uh Alamo Draft House is Well you had you had a very specific problem with Wreck It Ralph, <laughs> Andrew. I enjoyed Wreck It Ralph. Uh, uh certain certain thing. I won't say it if you won't say it. So the Alamo Draft House has a new policy starting on January 3rd, where not only in addition to their no no texting, no talking policy, they now have a no late seating policy where it's like if you buy a ticket and you show up and the features already started, they're not going to let you go in and and get seated and they'll just refund your money there. So like late seating equals like, is it once the feature starts or can you still come in during yeah, the previews? Yeah, you like, can come in during previews, but once the feature starts like that's right before the feature, they always have that, uh, that, that no, that no talking zone, uh, bumper. Have you ever seen a movie of the draft house, Justin? I have not. No, oh. eventually maybe I will. At, well, some point. If, if, at the address of the diamond club. I, uh, I yes. applaud that. Yeah, I sure. and I, That's I awesome. still, I'm, I'm the guy that like I get really annoyed when I'm sitting there and a little bright cell phone screen lights up in front of me, and and I'm easily distracted enough when I go out to the movies and so anything that can be done to make that and I still, I know it's like who's really bad about that now it was like I see like more older people doing that now too. Yeah. No. Well, the uh, I'm trying to find. I can never find the actual. Uh, bumper. Um, all I can find is the the angry voicemail thing they do. Um, here we go. Well, anyway, but they they do a really good job of uh, of of focusing just on the on the feature and. Uh, uh, yeah, it doesn't look like they have it. Anyway, allegedly they are uh, uh, construction. Continues on the uh, the mission, Alamo Draft House out here in old, an old fog town. It's too bad they had to tear down the Diamond Club in order to do it. What a bummer! Yes, yes they did. What a bummer! Uh, all right, gentlemen. Well, I'm going to go ahead and call this an evening. Um, I, uh, by the way, side effect of Ultra Marathon Man is I feel doughy and stupid and weak. Like I'm on a five mile run dying listening to this guy talking about. Running, running two hundred miles or whatever. I'm like, Ugh. yeah. But after you do your five mile run, you can carry on with the rest of your day. That's true. That is true. All right, guys. Uh, I guess we'll yes. shut it down. Uh, bye, bye. All right, gang. Bye. So long. Bye. So long. Going now. Bye-bye. Going downstairs. That's the end of the show alarm. All right. Bye-bye. All right. Bye, guys.